The simple answer is we need to build capabilities of teachers. The real answer is much more complex than that and I just want to give you some insights into that. We know that teachers have an incredible influence on student achievement. I often say that teaching is probably the most complex and challenging profession there is. Let me illustrate one dimension of that complexity and that challenge. And I think a lot of this has been influenced by my own background in dealing with children with hearing loss who I often say learn because of what teachers do, not in spite of what teachers do. But that's an old, that's an old part of my life. But the early years of primary school, the early years of primary school, uh, in this dimension I want to talk about, a really important period in a child's life which carries implications into later academic and social outcomes, in later academic and social outcomes. Research from developed countries suggests there's an increasing number of children who experience what's now called mill millennial morbidities. These are chronic behavioural developmental problems. They include ADHD, obesity, autism, le learning spectrum disorder, or uh, learning difficulties and so on. These children are often broadly referred to as special health care needs. What's that got to do with education? Well, it's got everything to do with education because it increases their risk for a chronic physical, developmental, behavioural or emotional condition which requires greater health and education services. There's this interface that needs to happen between health and education. So why am I talking about it? We, 4% of these sort of children actually get additional funding. I'll say something, but just remember the 4%. They recognise with health and educational problems. So in many developed countries, such as Australia, these children receive additional funding to access extra health and educational support. But there's another 18% of children, another 18% of children who experience these emerging conditions, but yet undiagnosed. No child should enter school and be a surprise to anybody when they get there. So that's the first thing. So these are grey areas. And these children are often absent from research and policy decisions. But the causes for these are many, and it can do with SES, at family background, learning disabilities, a whole range of things. But the thing about this early uh, period is that these these difficulties can be evident at the first year of school, but it's the early years of school. There's this brief window of opportunity where we can actually do something about it. So let's look at the broader challenge then for Australian education. I'm just going to throw some statistics out there. There's this relatively low, we're a relatively low equity country. We have this large gap between the highest and lowest performing students. You made reference to the funding issue, Maxine. We have a large proportion, 20% of students with additional needs. 20%, that's six kids in every class. These are the kids who learn, I'll put it in the, my terms, learn because of what teachers do, not in spite of what they do. 19.5% uh, of Victorian students are developmentally vulnerable in at least one area when they start school. 4% of students get government funding. But 25% of Victorian students have a language background other than English. 20% of Victorian Year 4 students don't mean the minimum reading proficiency. And then we get into adolescence and a lot of these kids who don't learn to read and so on, then they develop the adolescent issues uh, that, are, that are common. So, and there are other, there are other statistics and I won't go on with them. But, the, the, so there is a limited understand, and, the, and furthermore there's even at the other end of the scale, a limited understanding of the nature of giftedness and typically little adjustments are made for these kids. So the, there are various advocacy, ad, advocacy groups and researchers such as Patrick Griffin, Jeff Masters and others that argue that teachers don't have enough capabilities to meet the diverse learning needs of all students in the context. So how, how is the current system in Victoria coping with these challenges? In the state education system there are 79 special schools. In the Catholic se sector, there are seven. And if you scale up the ratio of the number of students there are in the Catholic sector compared to the state sector, that's a factor of four. There are four relatively four times as many special schools in the government sector. So why is the difference? The reasons are complex, but simplistically, in general, teachers do not have the assessment and intervention capabilities to make the appropriate adjustments in the regular class. 
So they look for more specialised help. And the needs are met in a special school. So in contrast, the Catholic Education Office, they don't have special schools. They really believe in full inclusion. So what do they do? They take their very best teachers, their lead teachers, and they develop them with professional certificates. So for example, in the last 15 years with the Catholics, Catholic Education Office, we've had a partnership. We have a professional certificate in English as an additional language, professional certificate in early literacy intervention, professional certificate in educational intervention, a master of student wellbeing, a professional certificate in oral language, ed, ed, uh, oral language learning. These are all skills that are needed by lead teachers to be able to advise the regular teachers about how to make reasonable adjustments. So let me look at this now in another dimension. And many of you would be aware that we we actually took the view that all teachers need these diagnostic and intervention skills. And so we introduced the Master of Teaching, which I describe as a genuine clinical master's degree in 2008. And it was about reimagining teacher education. And it was about producing teachers that was influenced by the Carnegie Corporation that said teaching should be considered to be an academically taught clinical practice profession. And I'll say what that means in a minute. But we said in 2006 we want the outcome of this to be to, to create teachers who are interventionist practitioners, capable of using evidence to identify and meet the needs of individual learners. And it was the statistics I've given you was, which was the driver. How do we, it's a developmentally based system. How do we differentiate our identification, but that differentiate our teaching to meet the needs? And it's underpinned with this, what I call clinical judgment for teaching. What is each learner ready to learn and what's the evidence that supports it? What's the possible evidence-based interventions? Uh, what teaching strategies would be, would, would, would be implemented? And what would be the expected impact and can the teacher actually access, assess the impact? And what happened and how would that be uh, presented? So we've had another go. I mean, this is a talk about what advice would I give the Victorian government we prepared what I called a green paper in the early in 2013, prior to the last federal election. It was called Focusing on the Learner, Charting a Way Forward for Australian Education. So a lot of the things I've been talking about were picked up in that paper. The paper argues that teaching is far from simplistic, but rather complex, challenging clinical practice profession. It requires high calibre indiv individuals as teachers. And it introduces these notions of clinical teaching but also student growth. Student growth simply refers to how much a student's learning has grown over a given period. We want to see at least a year's growth in student learning in every calendar year. So fundamentally, so we, in that report we, we, we propose 10 recommendations, but many of those align, you made reference to the, the TMAG report as we call it, the Teacher Education Ministerial Advisory Group, but it relates to how do we actually accredit teacher education uh, programs so that we can be confident that those teachers would be, uh, would be you'd be happy to have them teaching your own children, your own grandchildren. And it related to selection and it related to other things, but it very much was influenced by the experience we had in the Master of Teaching. But underpinning it, underpinning it is that we want graduates who actually have an impact on student learning. So, let me talk then about what should the specific priorities be. And these aren't random, but they build on some of the concepts that I've, that I've mentioned. None of them are particularly short term. I think many of them have a five to ten year horizon. But the first is change the notion of what success is. Everything's focused on high achievement. Does everybody reach a high benchmark? I think normal distributions still, uh, still exist. But we come back to the issue of growth. Success should be that every child deserves at least a year's progress for every year's input. That's the first thing. That's how we assess whether a school is effective or not. We accredit teacher education institutions on the evidence that their graduates can successfully impact on student learning. That's the second thing. Uh, I wouldn't mind taking half the current content out of the curriculum to allow room for surface and deep learning. We often hear about the crowded curriculum. Maybe that is a, I'm not sure if it's politically uh, sellable, but uh, it's an important element. I mean, it's very interesting. When you look at the face-to-face -face hours that our teachers have compared to Finland, 
It's about 4,000 hours in Finland and 7,000 hours for us between the years of sort of grade one to tw uh, seven or eight or something. It's extraordinary. There is actually time for students to think about learning. Help schools see their impact. They need to be able to see that they have, whether it's impact on individuals, whether it's impact on classes, whether it's impact uh, on the whole school. The fifth one, I would change the hierarchy of teacher pay scales. Aitzel's gone very nicely into defining what is graduate, proficient, accomplished and lead. But I think to get to each of those levels there need to be what I'll call a bar exam. And teachers need to go to those levels because of their capabilities rather than because of their longevity. And the lead teachers are the ones who need to lead this diagnostic interventionist teaching with their teams of teachers. But I think highly accomplished and lead teachers need greater pay and provided with uh, extra, uh, provided, uh, provided they actually stay in the classroom. The sixth thing, which is what I've just hinted at, professionally develop the lead teachers. There are many models for it. We've got one running, it happens to be, with the Catholic Ex Education Office. And they make suitable adjustments. And they don't need as many special schools. But professionally developed lead teachers with the advanced diagnostic and intervention skills to lead teams to meet the needs of all learners through appropriate adjustments. There will always be 1% to 2% of kids who need special, special facilities. That's, that's, but not the 4% that get funding. And certainly we need to do something about the 20% that have, have needs. Retain equity funding for hard to teach schools, low SES, learning difficulties and so on, providing, provided the recipient schools can actually show that their students gain at least a year's growth. That was the eighth. And the last one is, I would need, this is about student support services, where the psychologists are, the speech pathologists are, uh, the paediatricians and so on. They're very much focused on a hospital type of model. Here's the diagnosis. That's not good enough. It's here's the diagnosis and this is how it impacts on student learning and work very closely with teachers. So I think there needs to be a transformation of student support services. And there's nine, but none of it short term. Thanks, Maxine. Uh, look, Maxine, as I understand it, I've been asked to focus particularly on secondary education and that is what I will do. Um, my general perspective, I think, is very much like the one that the Minister um, uh, said that he held uh, in an interview that many of you will have seen with Jeff Maslin uh, earlier this month. Uh, now he had the, had the capital works thing, which of course you've got to have if you're a minister, but he also said, for me, it's tackling disadvantage. And that is certainly the general orientation that I would hold. It is very good to see a government and a minister, and particularly an education minister at a senior level in Cabinet, who has that general perspective. I'd want to expand it a bit, not to do away with it, but expand it. The, the problem with the disadvantaged concept and idea, which goes back well before the, the Carmel Report of 1973, is that, of course, it focuses on that particular group and it can very quickly lead to programs for and attention on a particular group, which leaves out of the picture the operation of the system as a whole. And the problems, many of them, that, it, that belong to those who are called the disadvantaged are actually generated by the workings of the system as a whole. And so it's very important, I think, to have programs which are of the kind that Phil was talking about, but not restrict to those. Um, and the general perspective that I would offer rather than focus on the disadvantage is the precept, all kids are educable. And it's the job of the system to organise itself so that it actually makes good on that precept. Now, once you think about the workings of the system as a whole and the, the, that which prevents it from, in fact, educating successfully all kids, the panorama gets pretty broad. And there are several things I would like to have on the list for the Minister. Uh, one of them is what my old friend and uh, Bill Hannon, who many of you here will know, is called um, the rules that sort the sheep from the goats from the alpacas. And those are the rules particularly which govern entry to choice between schools. They are badly broken, they have been broken 
for a long time. Uh, much of the difficulty there can be traced all the way back to Carmel 1973. However, I would not advise a minister to have a go at it. Uh, it's first of all not simply a state problem, although it is crucially. Uh, I just think politically it's too hard. I'd say something like that about the curriculum as a whole, which I think does have major structural problems. Uh, and I think there is an inherent tendency to advantage those in schools who least need the school's attention. But again, first of all, that is not really in the direct line of responsibility of the Minister, and second, I think it's just too big to bite off as a separate priority. It might be something to keep in mind, but not a priority. So, with those kinds of um, criteria in mind, my three priorities are Gonski, key performance indicators, and technology. And in respect of each of those, you'll find that I arrive at a perspective that's different from the one that Field applied. Not, I think, at odds with it, but, but quite different from it. Now, as far as Gonski goes, the first thing to say is if ever there were a policy which addressed the workings and structure of the system as a whole in a way which attended to those who most need attention, then the Gonski policy is it. It's just a terrific piece of public policy. And of course, that's one reason why we haven't got it yet. <laughs> the first problem, which I think Maxine alluded to, is to find the money, uh, and I'm confident that the Minister will, and then, of course, to distribute it. But I really want to emphasise that that's just the base camp. It's very important to press on from there with two other things which do not often leap to mind. The first one is to make sure that the money has been put to the most productive use. And here I'm a bit disabled because the computer is. I had some really nice graphics to show you. Um, and the second thing, and I'll come back to that in a moment, is that collect evidence to demonstrate that it's working and get it out there through a loudspeaker. The days when we can assume that commentators in particular and the public in general will buy the idea that more in means more out are well behind us and what's more, we're heading into very tight budgetary times. And Gonski's going to have hard enough uh, time getting up, let alone surviving. So collecting evidence about what works with that money is a crucial task for the government, in my view. Now, let me go back one step there to what I mean by make the money work and put it to maximum use. I was going to show you uh, two graphics. One some of you may know. Uh, it's from the Sutton Foundation toolkit. Has anyone here seen that? It's just terrific. And you can look it up on the web or under the Education Foundation toolkit. And it does a very simple thing. It lists about 20 interventions all the way from having a kid repeat a year to improving feedback systems to reducing class sizes to increasing the length of the school day to preschool programs to etc. And it then in three columns says, here's how much it costs, here's how good the evidence is that we have about this issue and here's how many months difference it will add to or take from a year's progress. And what you find when you go through there is that there are some things that are very effective but very expensive, reducing class sizes, for example, and other things which are even more effective but cost bugger all. And one of those, for example, is improving feedback systems. On the other hand, there are things that don't cost much and don't do anything, and there's one standout which costs a bomb and sends kids backward, and that's repeating a year. Now, I'd really urge you to have a look at that because it's both a useful tool in itself but also a real consciousness raiser about what should and should not be done with extra money coming into the school courtesy of Gonski or anyone else. And the natural reflex of the school system will be to spend it on what is, in my view, quite effective but highly expensive. And the crucial thing then is to apply a concept which is not common in schools, and that's opportunity cost. Sure, reducing class sizes will improve things, but what could we do with the same money somewhere else? What are we not doing because we've reduced class sizes? Now, the second slide I was going to show you is from a search that, amazingly enough, is 30 years old, and it was done uh, in the mid-'80s 
by Hank Levin and Eugene Glass and Gail Meister. And those of you here who are in the EdBiz will know that two of those three are very big names indeed in education research. And they compared a range of what they also called educational interventions and then did the sums in another way. And they said, if you spend $100 on this method rather than that method, what is going to be the difference in the learning produced? And it took the particular example of the, those two very popular areas, reading and mathematics gains. And the least effective <coughs> interventions were to reduce class sizes, whether from 35 to 30, 30 to 25, 25 to 20, or 35 to 20. Very expensive, not very effective. The same could be said about lengthening the school day. At that time in the early 80s, computer-aided instruction didn't work either. But there were three that did work and really worked. And there are three forms of tutoring. One is adult tutoring, the second is peer tutoring, and the third is cross-age tutoring. Adult tutoring is highly effective but very expensive. Peer and cross-age tutoring were highly effective and very cheap and yet they would be among the least used interventions in the school because, of course, they don't fit with the way that schools are organised or with schools' conceptions of what kids can do. Uh, and if I may sort of say so in, in Field's absence, I think one of the limitations of the current reform agenda is what I would call teacherism, which implies, of course, that the, the solution lies in what the teachers do to the kids I think it lies crucially also in what it is the kids do for and w with themselves and each other. But we'll say some more about that in a moment. Um, my second priority, how am I going for time yeah, actually? Yeah. Okay, um, is KPIs. Now where I see the Gonski uh, scheme as being exactly the kind of thing that you want to drive change, my interest in KPIs is that they're exactly the kind of thing that can ruin it. And so the best we can do with KPIs, since they're not going to go away, uh, is to make them as uh, little, uh, make them do as little damage as possible. Now, to that end, I've got two suggestions, and they flow from a bit of a browse that I had around the web over the weekend. You can find out quite a lot about what you could call cognitive outcomes. So you'll get NAPLAN results, you get VCE numbers, and so on. Uh, they're very limited in respect of cognitive learning, but they are only about particular kind of learning in particular kind of learning areas. What you won't find much about, in fact anything, is what I would call non-cognitive learning. And that's in areas like, um, again, sorry about my, Oh, um, the ability to collaborate, the capacity to listen, communication, time management, impulse control, self-presentation, persistence, self-discipline, things of those kinds. Now, there's plenty of evidence around that suggests several things about non-cognitive learning. The first is that schools can produce it. It can be deliberately learned in the school. I don't mean by that that it can be taught in a direct way, but it can be learned in a school. The second thing is that there is an interaction between cognitive and non-cognitive learning. And one of the best ways to improve cognitive learning is to focus on and improve non-cognitive learning. A third thing is that non-cognitive learning has a lot to do with the texture of life in the school. It is of value in and of itself, not as an outcome, but as an experience. And the final thing is that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that non-cognitive skills of that kind are of value in and of value in getting further study and employment. And so they are very powerful means of equipping kids in a way uh, that will work for them once they leave the school. The other thing that, were well, two other things that struck me when I looked around these websites is how little attention is paid, or at least how little evidence is available, thank you, uh, on how 
kids experience their schools. Now, as some of you will know, as Maxine mentioned, a part of my background is in the Good Universities Guide. And one of the things that made it possible and useful was a thing called the CEQ, the Course Experience Questionnaire. What that instrument and many others have demonstrated in other contexts <coughs> is that the most expert observers of teaching are those who are on the receiving end of it. And that it's a really valuable indicator and really valuable in pointing schools in the direction that counts. And what is more, it is the kind of thing in which schools that aren't going to be top of the wazers in cognitive outcomes can and should be very good at. And so it's a question of the school doing well in something that can do well in, in which it has all sorts of uh, flow on effects. Now, the last thing I'll be brief on that is there is nowhere in any of those websites that I could find, and I mean, in a way, even though I'm a klutzy user of the web, I'm a, a sort of relatively skilled understander of these kind of data. There is nowhere that I could find a clear, simple report card on a school which allowed comparison across schools and areas of activity and performance. I was reminded of uh, years ago, one of the people who launched the guides was Simon Crean when he was the federal minister. And after the launch, he took us aside and he said, listen, I use this all the time. Um, when I'm going out to a uni, I sit in the back seat and I read the guide. I can't follow the stuff the department prepares for me. <laughs> and, and that is, I think, the problem. There's a lot of information out there, but it's not in a form that's accessible. And the people we should be most concerned about are exactly the people who find it hardest to understand. And so I would like to see the Minister pay some, what do I call it, restorative attention to KPIs. Not to put too much trust into them, but to minimise the amount of harm they can do. <laughs> the, my third and last priority for the Minister is technology. And my subheading is get your head around it. Um, this, like Gonski and like KPIs, is another area of policy which addresses not a particular group or the disadvantage, but the workings of the system as a whole. And at the moment, school systems around the world are really making a meal of it. And some of you here will remember the Auditor General's report in 2012, which was absolutely scathing. In fact, he reviewed two areas of, of implementation in the department. One was hardware, terrific. The other was actually using it for educational purposes, awful. I also was going to show you a slide which showed a series of articles by an American academic called Larry Cuban. Articles he's written over 15 years about computers, and Larry's got quite a droll sense of humour. And they start off in 1989 with things like uh, computers, uh, laptops will fix the classroom, right? Uh, or uh, computers are the teacher's answer. Um, I can't, look, I can't remember the exact titles, but they were all very ironic and, and highly sceptical. And what Cuban is, is latching onto there is that schools, by and large, have failed to figure out what it is that technology can do. Now, there are an awful lot of ways of getting it wrong, and some that I'm aware of are that technology is basically a teacher resource, or a subset of that, technology is basically a way for the teacher to manage the learning program, or technology is access to resources for students. Another error is to focus on the technology or at the grand level, they've got it, we want it, uh, and they've got everything, so we'll have it too. Uh, great big systems, they're a total disaster. Now, I might be perhaps going too far in suggesting this, but in my view, getting technology right in schools is simple. I think all you have to do is follow three rules. The first is, it's about learning. What it's there for is for kids to use to learn. The second that follows from that is, technology is a, not a supplement to, or a surround of, but a substitution for some forms of teaching labour. And the third that follows from that is, that there therefore needs to be a reorganisation of almost every aspect of school and schooling. 
not a complete wiping of the slate, but a reorganisation. And the last graphic I was going to show you was comes from the United States and it compares the budget allocations of three types of schools. One is a conventional school. The second is a blended school, which combines conventional instruction with technology-delivered instruction. And the third is a virtual school. And as you can guess, those budgets are of different sizes and of different dispositions. And what you need to make technology work is to understand that schools are now at exactly the same point as many industries have been in since the Industrial Revolution. And that is, technology can substitute for some of the work that's done in the workplace and therefore there must be rearrangement of budget, of staffing profile, of working spaces and of understandings of what it is that teachers and students do and can do. And I think technology is particularly important in addressing the needy, uh, neediest kids in schools because it allows them to, or it requires I suppose, to shift resources and teaching effort <coughs> into the areas where it's most needed and it assists the transition of responsibility from the teacher to the students. So those would be the three things that I would suggest that the Minister focus hard on uh, and at very least um, try and find a good reason why it can't happen. Um, but uh, I think that, as I say, those are things which are, I li like, the ones that Field uh, suggested. They're large scale, they're long term, they require big thinking, they require small steps. Uh, but they are something that can only be done in and through a government and which I think a government that did it well would, regard, would find both educationally and politically rewarding. Thank you to the John Cairn Foundation for this invitation. Um, I have to say, Dean, that um, it was the first Chief Inspector of Technical Schools, Donald Clark, who first spoke about sheep and goats. Um, I think Bill Hannon made up the alpacas. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I don't remember those. Um, over the last decade, um, Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales have all commissioned major tracking studies um, following school leavers into their study in labour market destinations. I find it interesting that these have actually attracted, the, the reports coming from these studies have actually attracted relatively little attention in the media, despite the fact that they reveal some disturbing trends. Um, on the positive side, uh, all these surveys found that the majority of young people actually make a good transition into university, into apprenticeships, into traineeships, uh, and into higher vocational education and training. However, the transitions for the remainder, and we're talking about consistently about 25% of school completers are ending up mainly in part-time work, casual work, low-skilled, low-paid jobs. And most of that is in, is in hospitality and retail. It's not something that we talk about a lot. I think that the role of that part-time work can be seen in two ways. Uh, on the more positive, in the more, uh, looking at it more positively, we can say that young people employed during a gap year uh, or while they're students, they can, they can actually um, get important work skills, uh, experience working through these part-time and casual jobs. On the other hand, we know that the longer term outcomes for this group can be actually quite poor. Um, we know that they're at risk of churning through a series of low skilled jobs, through periods of unemployment and through periods when they're not actually in the labour market at all. And uh, there's a strong research base that suggests that not only has negative impacts on them, but also on their families. Writers like uh, Castles, Castell and Standing have described this decline of secure full-time jobs for young people um, right across the OECD. And, um, and, and we can say with confidence certainly that Australia is not, is not the worst of these countries. Um, but they've described these young people uh, as an emerging precariat, and I think that's a really good word for it. Young employees in short-term contracts dealing with job insecurity, often working in poor conditions, and usually working in, in jobs that, um, that provide little or no training, and I think that's quite an important aspect of it. Um, I think it's important to draw attention to the, labour, the, na the nature of the labour market for young people in Australia, but I don't think we can hold schools responsible for it. Schools are responsible for many things, but they don't create unemployment, which is the way it's often read in the media, unfortunately. 
Um, having said that, I think we can ask what schools can do to better prepare young people for these conditions. And certainly the research shows that young people are usually at their most vulnerable at points of transition. So transition from school, transition from university, uh, transition between different stages of education. Um, we might add to this that there's also a significant group who don't complete school at all. So we mustn't forget that 20% or so, uh, and it's probably a little higher than that in Victoria. Um, one fifth of the cohort, they're not completing year 12. The outcomes for that group are even more worrying. Apart from uh, a, a proportion, about a third of the boys uh, who end up getting apprenticeships, the outcomes for that group are actually quite weak. And the proportion from, from those early leavers who end up in part-time work in these kinds of residualised jobs are even higher than for, for Year 12 completers. So what are we doing to support young people through these transitions? I want to talk about um, three main strategies tonight. One of them, um, and it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a strategy that's been around for a while, is um, vocational programs in schools or that in schools. Um, I think these programs can be better adapted to, um, to support the needs of young people. Another strategy is the role of careers advice, um, particularly the role of careers advice in helping young people plan and make choices. And I think there are ways we can do that better too. And finally, I want to talk about the structures of schooling, particularly the role of alternative providers and adult providers like TAFE, uh, as well as the um, private providers. And I'm going to draw on some work that um, both Mary Lay and Shelley Gillis uh, have contributed to success uh, uh, significantly, uh, particularly in relation to some recent work we did for New South Wales. Um, the first strategy is vet in schools. I think there are some, there are some big problems here. The different studies and subjects which combine to make up a young person's senior secondary certificate, like the VCE, need to be connected. I don't think that's something we do very well uh, in this country, and it's not just in Victoria, and it's not just in vetting schools. I think there's a group of young people who know how to connect their subjects very, very well. Uh, these are the people who know that they want to get into medicine and they know which sciences they need to do or they want to get into law or arts and they know what subjects they need to do. Um, I think unfortunately for those going into vocational programs, that sense of connecting up their curriculum and their program doesn't exist as strongly. So let me give you an example. If a student wants to do a certificate to an electronics, uh, you would imagine that doing mathematics would be a pretty important part of that, and it is. Um, and yet there is no um, set of rules, there's no mandating, and often not even any advice to young people that yes, you should be doing <laughs> high level mathematics if you want to cert to uh, in electronics. I think we give young people considerable choice and I think in many cases the subject selections that they do, particularly those at the more disadvantaged end of the curriculum, the subject selections that they do do not combine well to form a program with clearly identifiable, path uh, identifiable pathways. I think there's a reluctance amongst our, um, the people working in our boards of studies, and that includes the VCAA, to mandate coherent programs. That doesn't make me popular to say that because I know that they, um, they don't think we should be mandating what kids do. Um, but I certainly don't believe that unfettered choice of uh, subjects is a good idea and it's certainly not the norm internationally. If you look at programs uh, right across most European systems, when kids choose a program, they choose a program, not a subject. So they might choose a program of humanities or they might choose a program of sciences or a program relating to a vocational area. But once they've chosen the program, the selection of subjects is mandated. Um, another issue is uh, funding. VET subjects are more expensive to deliver than English or French. It sounds pretty obvious, but the message doesn't seem to be um, getting through because we still continue to charge students for materials and other aspects of their vocational subjects, despite the fact that these are the kids most likely to come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, it's also more expensive for schools to offer. Um, schools have to bear those costs, and schools working in disadvantaged communities, which are actually taking on the, the, the greater burden of dealing with these kids, are also the ones dealing with these more expensive programs, and often uh, not um, being uh, compensated for that. 
Um, one of the very expensive parts of delivering vocational programs is the partnerships that schools form in order to deliver effective work placement. Um, this forms the subject of an ARC, which um, we're running out of our group at the moment. And uh, what we're finding is that we need a more efficient way of um, helping schools to form these partnerships. Vetting school students in New South Wales are required to complete 40 hours of structured work placement per year, um, with some requiring up to 70 hours of mandatory work placement. In New South Wales, that means providing work <coughs> placements to 65,000 students. I think New South Wales does this very efficiently, and I think there is um, a lot we could learn from that particular state. In 2013, there were more than 20,000 registered providers of school work placements in New South Wales. I doubt if we could say that in Victoria. Um, it's an expensive and time-consuming job, both in terms of reviewing the suitability of work placements, preparing students for them, uh, supervising the students on visits, and also communicating with employers to make sure that the information that they provide um, is effective for students, but also to make sure that the safety and uh, the interests of the students are actually being met. All of this becomes harder if you look at rural and regional settings. Um, and our current ARC research suggests that the centralised and very comprehensive approach that New South Wales uses is actually a good way to do it. Um, the Education Council in 2014 recommended that we needed better links between schools, providers and employers. And uh, this is, I think, something that we see in very effective systems like those of Germany and Denmark. And um, you know, this is something, obviously, that, that Maxine and I have spoken a lot about. Those are systems which depend on business, unions, uh, employers, government, schools, other providers, all acting together as social partners in the interests of the kids. I don't think it's something we do very well here. Um, we can't simply implement a model like that in this country. You can't, that's not the way policy borrowing works. Um, we have a system that relies on market mechanisms, I think, rather than, um, rather than training systems to supply skilled workers. The problem with this is that it's led to a reluctance, I think, on the part of industry and trade unions to actually engage in the design of vocational studies um, and to contribute to the things that those studies need to be successful. Uh, Germany and Denmark, um, I think they work well. There's usually a requirement from employers to offer training places and there are some subsidised and tax benefits available to them in return. I think these are ideas that we need to think about. Um, I'm going to turn to careers education now just briefly. Um, in Australia, we've adopted a model of careers education which is largely school-based. Um, again, in an international context, this is not the norm. In many international systems, careers education is actually a partnership. In fact, there are problems with purely school-based careers education. There can be incentives to provide students with the counselling advice that meets the needs of the school rather than the student. That is, to provide less than unbiased advice. External provision has problems too, but if you look at the OECD's recent recommendations, it actually recommends that externally based services working with schools is the best approach to take. They recommend a partnership model in which schools are responsible for some areas of careers development, but partner with external agencies in order to provide good unbiased advice. And certainly Richard Sweet, um, formerly of Dusseldorp, also sees best practice as being something which provides structured links between schools and external resources and external programs. And again, this is something that can be expensive for schools to do, so um, having access to external resources can be a real advantage. If we want to look at international models which work, um, the Careers New Zealand is one, and there is one in Wales, and I won't attempt to say it because my Welsh isn't good enough, um, but you can, you can email me and I can tell you what it's called. Um, to me, it just looks like a collection of um, uh, unintelligible words. Um, and these are both partnership models as well. Um, the last thing I want to look at is schooling structures. Am I okay for time? Um, I think schooling structures need to be flexible enough to deal with a broad range of students. And I think if we're going to talk about them um, in the broadest sense, we need to talk about schools, but we also need to talk about adult education providers like TAFE 
and we also need to talk about what role those adult education providers and other providers, including private ones, might, pay, might play. Um, recently, we've seen the emergence of specialist vocational providers. We've all heard about the trade training centres. Um, but this is an area that actually TAFE has occupied for quite a while. Uh, Bradfield College in Sydney has been around for a long time. More recently, Holmesden and RMIT have also moved into the space of offering courses for school-aged clients. But there are other models as well, including the senior secondary colleges. Um, there are also adult sector, adult education sector providers like neighbourhood houses, TAFE, adult community education. All of these are increasingly being used uh, to train um, and to educate year 10 to year 12 equivalent young people. Uh, in some cases they offer uh, vocational qualifications, accredited vocational qualifications, but not in all cases. I think these providers are making important contributions, but I think we need to look at what they're actually doing and how effective it is. There is evidence that a more adult setting is actually more appropriate for many young people, especially those who feel marginalised or disenfranchised by the traditional structures of upper secondary schooling. Well over 35 years ago, um, a British researcher called McFarlane questioned the appropriateness of 18-year-olds being in the same school as 14-year-olds. And he actually um, said, why should we make 18-year-olds conform to the rules that we're imposing on, um, on the 13 and the 14-year-olds? He stressed the potential of this to damage both the younger group as well as the limitations placed on the growth uh, and development of the, older, of the older group. So what kind of model works best? Is TAFE the answer? Uh, Joanna Wynne did some fantastic work um, about 10 years ago on TAFE and she really, uh, she argued in, in, in her paper that TAFE actually struggles with ideas of duty of care and pastoral care, um, that um, dealing with parents is actually a problem for many in TAFE because they're used to dealing with the client and the client is the young person. And some research that we did more recently actually questioned um, actually saw TAFE lecturers themselves questioning their ability to deal with the needs of younger learners, uh, who obviously are a very different clientele from the adult clientele that many in TAFE have been used to. Uh, we might also note, um, in the light of recent concerns with the quality of vet provision, uh, which has been in the media, of course, especially over the last day or two in the private sector, that young people are facing an increasingly complex task when they need to choose between the diverse range of organisations as well as qualifications that are being offered to them. Underpinning this idea of a training market is an assumption, I think, that young people are all equally informed about making choices, that it's easy for them, uh, that they understand what courses are best suited to meet their needs, um, that they understand um, the costs involved, including deferred costs, and we're certainly getting evidence that that's not the case. If you think about it, we're asking young people to assess the quality and the cost and the potential benefit of undertaking a qualification, as well as the quality and the standing of the provider. Now, I don't think that's a fair ask. Uh, and we know that there is evidence um, that unscrupulous providers are actually targeting some of the most disadvantaged kids in our community, often promoting expensive courses, and, um, and these are not courses that are necessarily doing much to expand the employment opportunities of these young people. That also has an impact on the faith of employers in those qualifications. So, um, in my opinion, I think senior colleges, um, senior schools, uh, collegiates, whatever the model you might be, and there are a number of different models out there, whatever you might want to call them, I think the research suggests that these offer probably a safer bet than moving into the adult sector providers for young people um, by providing both a, a more appropriate env environment for young adults, but also showing the duty of care um, characteristics that we expect of our schools. Having said this, um, my work um, recently showed that there are significant concerns among teachers and teacher unions um, with this model and, uh, and particularly with the teachers who are working in the junior sites and their concerns about being promoted, having access to the, you know, the important pointy end of the curriculum as they call it, the VCE, 
Um, having said that, I think these are concerns that can be addressed. So, to finish off, um, I think I'd argue that school-based programs, including VET, need to be more coherent. We need to recognise the resource implications for, for schools. And we need to understand that the status and effectiveness of school-based VET can only be improved if the broader community, including business, uh, actually takes on a greater role. High quality careers advice and guidance are vital to support young people. Um, and here, I think the evidence suggests a partnership model is the best way to go. Finally, with regard to mainstream secondary school schooling, I think it's not a model that caters for all kids. Um, we've got to look at alternatives. Um, the sociologist Ringer, about 50 years ago, described how the guardians of orthodoxy, as he put it, have actually protected schools from the need to modernise their curriculum. Um, I think, it was, I think that was nicely put. More recently, mm. um, the late Jack Keating argued that if we start pushing our students out of schools into the adult vet sector, all we're doing in a sense is shielding schools and protecting them from doing the things that they actually need to learn to do. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the uh, John Kane Foundation for the um, kind invitation to speak tonight. Um, um, John and I actually go back a, a long way and it, um, it's, it's a quite apt actually because I'm going to talk a little bit about a paper we're releasing tomorrow in the Mitch Institute which I've, um, uh, which I've co-authored um, around the concept of a, uh, an entitlement to uh, tertiary education, a student entitlement. And when I was about 14 years old, I'll, I'll say that because otherwise it'll date me, uh, I worked as an advisor in uh, John Kane's government and we came up with this concept of um, a youth guarantee, uh, which was actually taken from OECD literature at the time and from people like Peter Carmel and others. Um, and it really was a, um, a, a proposal from the state government uh, initiated during the election campaign to offer all young people the, the opportunity to make sure they had a place in, um, in education, training or work. Um, and it actually became, I think you'll remember, John, a very big issue in the 1980, uh, 1985 campaign. Unfortunately, we had, the, we had the policy right to go. The only problem is we didn't have the federal government um, on site at the time. And of course, you can't really deliver something like a youth guarantee without a coherent engagement with both levels of government. The reason I raise that is that the problem that we have then still bedevils us today, which is that there's a, um, a, a significant um, um, division in responsibility between the Commonwealth state and state governments for the funding of higher education and the funding of VET. And that, that um, the lack of a settlement on that issue um, is, uh, is leading now to, um, I think, um, adverse outcomes across the tertiary sector. So my focus um, by agreement with, uh, with Maxine was that I'd actually focus more on tertiary education, but also segue back into some of John's comments. And I took the liberty of asking John if I could read his notes because I thought I knew what he was going to say. And so I'll truncate a bit of what I was going to say by saying I, I largely agree with John and I don't need to go over some of those issues. Um, the paper we're la launching tomorrow is one which basically tries to do two things. One is to uh, more clearly allocate the responsibilities for funding tertiary education, tertiary education defined here in our minds as certificate three right through to postgraduate coursework programs. Um, I was involved in um, a proposal from the, the then, then Victorian government through Joan Kerner to try and get the Commonwealth to take over in fact responsibility for funding TAFE and higher education to make it a, full, a fully national um, responsibility. It nearly succeeded. It was scuppered by, uh, by one Kevin Rudd when he was working for Wayne Goss at the time. Queensland, we couldn't get over the line. And what we ended up with was a continuation of divided funding responsibilities between the Commonwealth and the states. Um, what, what that's meant is that the, um, uh, the states, of course, don't have the fiscal capacity to uh, resource um, the TAFE or the VET system. Um, now, the exception to that is Victoria, and I'll come back to that in a minute, because Victoria is a real standout in this. But what's happened nationally is that, um, and I had some graphs which unfortunately we can't show, but effectively um, funding on schools is increasing, funding on higher education is increasing significantly, and funding on vocational education and training is actually, is actually going backwards. Last year, uh, sorry, in 2013, the states reduced funding on vocational education and training 
by $340 million at the same time as they introduced their concept of, a, of an entitlement in debt. Now, the exception to that is Victoria. Victoria is a complete standout on this, and again, I would have shown a graph which basically showed that Victoria um, compound growth over about the last six or seven years in Victoria is about 7% uh, a year. It's increased funding on debt by over 40%. So when people, when you hear the stories about cutbacks in TAFE and things like that, you have to actually take that into account. The, the total spend on debt has actually gone up a lot. It's just that TAFE has not done well out of that, uh, out of that allocation. What that means, and I'll come back to it in a minute because I, I know we do need to talk about Victoria <coughs> specifically, is that with all of the problems in the training market in Victoria, and they're certainly there, there is actually a very significant resource base, a very significant resourcing base in the Victorian debt system to be drawn on, as long as Treasury um, don't get their uh, don't get their hands on it. Um, what the other bit of work we're doing is basically focusing to come back to this concept of the youth guarantee, is around the concept of of an entitlement. <coughs> it was recommended in the Bradley review, and then unfortunately not pursued through by successive ministers and prime ministers in in the Rudd and Gillard years. Uh, what we proposed was that the Commonwealth Government should commit to a tertiary education entitlement and that it should actually span the, um, the, 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 the degree programs, which the government, the, the Rudd Government, uh, did a terrific job in, of course, beginning the funding of the, um, the demand-based system. But they didn't extend that entitlement down into the demand-based system, into the diploma, advanced diploma and associate um, degree area. Now whatever, whatever you else you think about the, the Christopher Pine reforms in terms of fee deregulation, in my mind one of the very good initiatives that is in that package is a proposal to extend the funding down to the sub-degree level. The problem is if they do that and leave the VET, the equivalent VET qualifications, the VET diplomas and advanced diplomas funded by the states, you can see very quickly what will happen, which is that the top end of, of VET will be swallowed up into the higher education system faster than you can blink. Um, some people would probably say uh, that's a good thing. I don't think it is for exactly the reasons that John mentioned because the, the purpose built more vocationally oriented qualifications are designed more specifically for workforce interests, work for entry, for a, for a large co cohort of, of young people for whom going into higher education, particularly at that point in their life, is not the right option. What they should be able to do uh, is acquire a shorter cycle of high quality vocational qualification and then transfer with credit into, into, into degrees uh, at some later point. There's a real risk if we end up just turning those higher level VET qualifications into higher education pathway qualifications that their vocational purpose will be lost. And the very group of people that, I don't know whether John agrees with me or not, but the, the very group of people that John is most concerned about will, will, will be disadvantaged by that because basically the dominant paradigm of higher education will start to flow right back through the, um, the system. The way we are therefore proposing to um, um, uh, arrange this in terms of the, uh, the Federation, and we, we've, um, some of the work we've been doing has been cited in the, the very good Federation uh, issues paper on, um, on that. It, it's for those who are interested, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very, very good piece of work. Um, what we're proposing is that each level of government should take clear responsibility for funding a particular set of qualifications in the VET system. So there's no ambiguity then about who's got the accountability for it. In our minds, the states would take responsibility for funding um, all certificates, um, from certificate one through to certificate four. Certificates one and two would effectively be regarded as secondary or preparatory qualifications. Completely agree with what John says about the way those qualifications would be organised much more purpose built than the current fairly um, poor design of the current VET certificate ones and twos. They really would be, they really would be designed for the, exactly the sort of client group, that uh, student group that John's talking about. But they would be regarded essentially as pre-tertiary. They would be very low cost or fee free altogether, preferably. And the tertiary system would really start at certificate level three, going right through to postgraduate coursework. Both levels of government would agree within their, those respective funding responsibilities to an overall comprehensive design of a tertiary entitlement model that spans, that 
spans the, the entire tertiary system. Um, controversially, we'll be recommending that the Commonwealth should extend its income contingent loan system into across the tertiary sector. People will say, well, it's already blowing out, that fee help is already being rorted, why would you do that? We would say, well, in fact, you need to fix that up because it is no doubt at all that it is being abused. But the reality is that um, a lot of um, uh, particularly young people in certificates three and four are now facing fees, upfront fees, of five, six, seven thousand dollars routinely because the states are um, um, uh, claim or don't have the resources to fund those programs. Those students don't have access to an income contingent loan. And um, the, the, the up, if you do the economics, talk to somebody like Bruce Chapman about what that means, in pre net present value terms, $7,000, $6,000 out the door now, as opposed to being able to defer that commitment into an income contingent loan scene is a, is a really gross anomaly. Um, I, I do want to make one comment about policy ad hocism, because I think within that system, the, the apprenticeship system is, is overly preferenced. Um, I, I'll, I'll be blunt, I think the, the um, Andrews government's decisions to uh, um, offer a 50% rebate for apprentice car registration was probably cute, but money wasted um, and poorly targeted. And similarly, the Abbott government's extension of income contingent loads to apprentices, where they can borrow up to $20,000 to meet their study and living costs, um, uh, rather than actually looking at the, whole, the needs of the whole learner group. Uh, so let me give you a very concrete example of what that would mean. It would mean if you're uh, um, a boy with a ute um, and uh, you were a, um, uh, a building apprentice, um, uh, facing fees and facing other study costs, you'll be able to get an income contingent loan and you'll get half your car registration paid. If you're a young woman, uh, wanting to do a certificate three in childcare, also with a mandatory work placement, also facing a range of other costs. Um, you could be paying a, three, a fee of up to three or $4,000, no access to an income contingent loan, and nobody helping pay for your car registration. So what's happening is that people are, are cherry picking uh, qualifications and pathways and preferring them in particular ways. And what we really need is the kind of thing that John was talking about, which is a much more co coherent focus across all of these qualifications. Uh, I also agree with John that I think access to this entitlement should be based on much more coherent study pathways through secondary schools so that young people coming through basically know, firstly, they've got an entitlement and they've got a much clearer idea of what the roadmap and the rules are to get into a particular occupation. I would have a much smaller range of providers in the VET system, particularly for this group of, of learners, often quite vulnerable learners, um, I'm not one who basically says there's, there's anything wrong with, with choice or having some basis of a market approach, but having 500 providers in, in the VET system in Victoria is just simply insane. Um, you, you actually have to purpose, we have to work back from purpose building qualifications and pathways for particular learner groups, then working out what groups of providers are best oriented to deliver them. Um, for example, people will say, well, um, an assessment only or fully on the job pathway, that's a rort. Well, it's actually not a rort if you're a 50 year old worker who doesn't want to go back to full time study, who needs something which is highly relevant to the workplace, probably delivered on the job. But is that the right pathway for a 17 year old struggling through school um, who's simply got registration to, to deliver the qualification? In other words, we need to be much more careful about how we actually design the provider system and how we then, li how we then link uh, qualifications to those providers and to learner groups. Um, and again, I'll just agree with John about what that means in terms of, um, of curriculum and course design so that people have got coherent learning pathways into that system. Um, I think, uh, think Mary and I were probably both um, smiling inwardly when we heard John talk about um, vetting schools funding because um, without talking out of school, we have been involved in doing a recent review in an unknown jurisdiction. Um, and it, what, uh, what really angers me is that all of the problems that John mentioned have been there and they've been there for a long time. And I'll, I'll be blunter than John. Government schools in this state and in other states are completely and openly defying government policy on free secondary education. They are wantonly charging 
students under the guise of charging you materials fees, tuition fees, because they can't be bothered organising the funding in the school curriculum in a way that doesn't preference the academic subjects. So working class kids in bedding school subjects are being slugged fees in sometimes in, in excess of $1,000 under the guise of materials fees simply so schools can continue to use their core funding for academic programs and treat the bedding schools programs <coughs> as, a, as an added <coughs> extra. That's not characteristic of all schools but it's characteristic of many schools <coughs> and we know that the resourcing base for the trade training centres in Victoria is inadequate. There is actually a real risk with the new um, technical schools initiative that unless this resourcing <coughs> issue is sorted out we will end up with another capital driven solution when there is already significant excess capacity in TAFE, excess capacity in the existing trade training centres. We do not need more facilities, we need better funding, we need more teachers and we need better curriculum design to deliver that system. Um, so my advice to the state government I think would be at one end of the spectrum to look um, at the broader tertiary system in terms of thinking through how Bruce McKenzie's review of the Victorian training guarantee and vet funding in Victoria is going to be organised. We keep doing Commonwealth reviews of higher education and state reviews of TAFE or VET and we never quite connect them. Um, I think it's good that Bruce actually has experience as a TAFE, as an institute director across senior secondary through his vocational school, of course TAFE and also being a higher ed provider. We do need to take this holistic view and think about how the top end of TAFE connects with um, higher education and we need to think about how certificate ones and twos and the pathway into VET connects to, to schools and to VET in schools. The other thing I would say is that we should probably go back and just look at a lot of the existing reports and the evidence, what's already been known and documented. In many, in many ways we really don't need more reviews. What we really need is basically some probably some good literature reviews to say what are the key um, what is the key evidence, what are the key learnings that have come out of things over the last few years and ha how do we now pull those forward into a, into a coherent policy framework. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much.